bless and magnify the name that is above every other name. We worship the name of Jesus in this house. You are the guest of honor in this house. We make room for you in this house, oh God, and we make room for you in our house, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. 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 Let's thank the Lord. I know we did before, but the worship, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. I entitled my word for today. It's called Mary, Did You Know? And I want us, as I read the story, even though you know it, I want you to see it with fresh eyes. I want, you to, I want you to hear it with fresh ears, as though you never, ever heard the story before, okay? So you're going to kind of go like this. You're going to go like this, and you're going to like wipe away all that you know about the Christmas story. And I want you to put yourself in Mary's place. I want you to put yourself in the position, all of a sudden you're in your home, and an angel swoops down and suddenly appears to you and has this conversation with you and makes these declarations over your life. Okay? I'm going to start with Luke. And it says, during the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that's Mary's cousin, the angel Gabriel was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee. So just a side note, this angel swoops down into Mary's home, appears out of nowhere, and he doesn't appear uh, to someone that lived in Jerusalem. That was the hub. That was the religious hub of the time. But he goes to Nazareth. If you look up anything about Nazareth, it was a poor town. They also called it drunk town. People, you know, didn't, uh, many didn't have jobs. There wasn't a lot of commerce there. It was off the beaten path. And this angel comes and he visits this young virgin girl. So think about this. Everything according to the world's standards made Mary unusable. She's a girl. She's unmarried. And she's poor. So I just want us to, off the bat, realize that God doesn't choose according to location where you live, vocation what you do, status who you are, or what you have, or gender who you are, okay? So now we're going to go on. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a true descendant of King David. So she's marrying into somebody that has um, a background of religiosity, right? King David, he is connected to him. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Grace to you, young woman, for the Lord is with you. So you are anointed by God with great favor. Now the Bible says Mary was deeply troubled by the words of the angel and was bewildered over what this may mean for her. Now, obviously, Mary is a processor. If this was me and the angel swooped into my room and said, grace to you, you are highly favored, I would have been off and running. But Mary is a processor, so she's kind of bewildered. She doesn't take things at face value. But the angel reassured her, saying, do not yield to your fear. Change your paradigm, Mary, for the Lord has found great delight in you and has chosen to surprise you. Who doesn't love surprises? Surprise you with a wonderful gift. You will become pregnant. What, what? You will become pregnant with a baby boy. We got the gender reveal. 
and you are to name him Jesus. Took all the guesswork and the stress work out of trying to come up with the name. Heaven already decided it for her. And he will be supreme and will be known as the son in, of the highest and the Lord will enthrone him as the king of his ancestors, uh, David's throne. Okay, so he's going to be supreme, known as son of the highest. This is Mary's son, so this is huge. This is very, very important. I mean, this is like mega. And Mary, again, the processor, she says, how could this be? Come on, Mary. This is an angel in the room. The angel's going to figure everything out for you. So Gabriel answered, the spirit of holiness will fall upon you. And the almighty God will spread his shadow and power over you in a cloud of glory. Woo! Come on. This is why the child born to you will be holy and will be called the son of God. Then Mary responds, this is amazing. She is like, sign me up. Remember we used to sing that song, sign me up for the gospel jubilee? <laughs> Write my name on the roll. Yes, yeah, she's like, sign me up. She says, I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass. And now the angel leaves the room. She never sees the angel again. She is kind of on her own. Okay. Then she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. She is sent to the hill country. With a loud voice, Elizabeth prophesies, Mary, you are a woman given the highest favor and privilege above all others. Great favor is upon you. And then Mary burst out into song. Okay, the Bible says, my, and Mary sang this song. My soul is ecstatic, overflowing with praises to God. My spirit bursts with joy over my life-giving God, for he has set his tender gaze upon me, his lowly servant. And from now on, everyone, everyone will know that I have been favored and blessed. When I go to the temple, everyone's going to be looking at me. When I walk down the street, everybody's going to know that I am blessed and favored by God. What do you think Mary was thinking when she heard these words? I'll tell you what, what I'd be thinking. I'd be thinking words like blessed, highly favored, anointed. He delights in me. My son will be supreme. He will reign forever. The spirit of holiness has fallen upon me. I am privileged. Everyone's going to know that I am blessed. Visions of sugar plums dancing in my head. It's as though I had the lotto ticket and won that uh, $31 billion, $39 billion lotto, like all the numbers match. It's like sitting in Oprah's audience and it's like, you get a car, you got a car, you got a car. <laughs> you got a car. I mean, she is giving birth to the king of kings. I am sure that's when Handel's Messiah was written. Right there, right on the spot. Hallelujah. I mean, it just filled the whole room. And her son is going to be the king. The king of kings. Move over Elvis. Move over LeBron. My son is the king of kings. This is bigger than worldwide. This is Galactica. Okay, okay. Let me come down from my high. I've got to plan a wedding. Got to plan a wedding. Got to plan a wedding. Got to Google. Who's the best wedding planner? Yeah, I'll call Joseph later. I got to get a videographer. That video, he's got to follow me around from the beginning to the end. I mean, this is like really important. I mean, this is like going to be on Netflix. This is bigger than Megan and uh, Harry, whatever. This is a documentary. This is going to be the wedding of the century. No, the wedding of the centuries. Bigger than George Clooney and Amal's wedding in the, in the castle. That's right, bigger than Kim and Kanye. Yes, yes, yes. Destination wedding. Create an experience. Got to have a TikTok moment. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, thinking of the Jerusalem Hilton? No, you're thinking too small, Jerusalem Hilton. You need Shea Jerusalem Chateau. That's right. Got to call them up. Okay, it's, go it's going to be expensive, gonna, but heaven, <laughs> heaven's going to provide. Heaven's going to provide every single penny. They're going to, uh, you know, the angel's probably going to come back and on a little pillow have the engagement ring <laughs> and the wedding band, right? And, uh, I mean, best, best guess, dignitaries. <laughs> best wine. I mean, I see wine in my son's future. I just have this... <laughs> Feeling, you know, best delicacies, designer dress with a lot of bling, bling, bling. Joseph's eyes are going to like roll around in his head. And I got to already plan for the best obstetrician. This is the king of kings. I got to call Dr. Abraham, make sure that he's available uh, at that time. Beth Israel Medical Center for sure. <laughs> Yes, yes, I want a private room. I want nurses and aides round the clock monitoring my baby. I do want a, a private room. It has to be private. No, no, I want the whole floor. It has to be a private floor. He's the king. Come on, private floor. Oh, that's right. It has to be spotless, clean, beautiful. I, I mean, come on. Now, the king, when I go into labor, the king, again, Handel's Messiah comes down playing the orchestra. Hallelujah, right? right? And of course, Joseph and Mary, when they leave the hospital, they end up going home to their mansion because, of course, heaven provided the mansion and her baby's room. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be little lamb wallpaper, <laughs> little lamb bumpers, little lamb crib sheets. I mean, like the whole magic. And Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they lived happily ever after. We know that that's not even close to what happened. There was no orchestra. There was no applause. There were no dignitaries. There was no wedding. There was no glitz and glamour. She becomes pregnant, and of course, her mother has to send her to the hill country because her daughter might have been stoned and because there's gossip in the town her mother wants to spare her life so she has to now travel to the hill country where she connects with her cousin Elizabeth and her and her 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 fiance the bible says he wanted to put her away silently that's another word for he wanted to dump her but thank God the angel shows up with Joseph and tells her that what she is carrying is from God. And here she is now, nine months pregnant, nine months pregnant. And all of a sudden, the census arises. And she has to travel 80 miles to Bethlehem. Nine months pregnant. Come on, God. Come on, God. You're the one that got me in this situation. Are you, are you kidding me? Can't you postpone this uh, census by, by a month or two until I get back on my feet? But no, she has to go on a donkey 90 miles, 80 miles. I looked it up, and from my house, uh, 80 miles would be Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Imagine nine months pregnant on a donkey. Traveling to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. What a painful, painful ride. And the Bible says while she was there. Where? While she was there in Bethlehem. 80 miles away from her mother and father. 80 miles away. Feeling all alone. The contractions start. There where there was no room. There was no baby's room. There were no little lamb wallpaper or bumpers or crib sheets. While she was there, the innkeeper says, I'm sorry, there is no room. But while she was there, like an afterthought, the, the innkeeper says, oh, you can have a spot in the stable where there's soaked, filled urine, hay, and 
and manure. There, Mary, while you were there, blessed and highly favored Mary while you were there. It was there that Joseph becomes the unlikely midwife, and it was there that lowly shepherds come and visit. And the feeding trough becomes a crib. And then the Bible tells us that eight days later, she, has to, she goes and she dedicates her baby. She goes to the temple to dedicate her baby. And they were so poor that commentators say, normally you're supposed to bring a lamb. Well, in essence, she was bringing a lamb. But she was so poor that she brought pigeons instead of a lamb. Blessed and highly favored Mary couldn't even afford a lamb to bring. And while she was there, a prophetic word comes. Man, she must have been excited when she might have heard, you know, some uproar. A prophetic word is going to come and a prophetic word is going to give me a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of affirmation. But the Bible says that Simon prophesies to Mary and tells Mary, blessed and highly favored Mary, a painful sword will pierce your inner being, for your child will be rejected by many. And then they get the word there that Herod now is going to kill all the baby boys. So she has to travel 106 miles to Egypt there and hides out for three years. So here's my question today. If Mary knew, would she have said yes? Was the angel lying to Mary? Was the angel exaggerating or embellishing the state of Mary's affairs? Was Mary truly blessed and highly favored? You see, we have somehow been led to believe that Blessing means that you have a mate, a mansion, a Mercedes, and a mink. That's what Christianity has morphed into. We have a huge Instagram following. The word blessed and highly favored, it's been hijacked by the world, and it's been unfortunately hijacked by the Church, church culture has hijacked what those words blessed and highly favored really means. We've come to the conclusion that people who are rich and prosperous and have a perfect house or a big house or their children are perfect and your spouse never walks out on you, that they're more loved by God than people that are poor and don't have a perfect home, might have a small apartment, don't have a big paycheck, that they're somehow spiritually deficient. They're the lower tier. And this kind of thinking is false. It's heresy. It's a demonic strategy to pull us away from what really matters, that which is eternal, not temporal. It's created so much confusion and division even in the body of Christ. Listen, it's not the size of your apartment. It's the size of your God in your apartment. We have these spiritual haves and have-nots. And the the haves have made it in the shade. They have sunshine on a cloudy day. When it's cold outside, they got the month of May. They never seem to struggle. So the question becomes, what's wrong with my faith? What's wrong with my God? Does my God care about me? And Christianity, it's morphed into this self-absorbed, self-entitlement mentality instead of the self-denial that our Bible talks about. It says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat people's trials and and sufferings, and yet we kind of gloss over it. The word suffering, trials, you know, if, if for the most part, not here, but for the most part, people have skipped over that stuff. 
They make you feel that, that everything's going to be wonderful. But you know, you read the word, was everything wonderful for the people of God? Was everything wonderful for Mary? Joyce Meyer said that she had gotten some things wrong in regards to her understanding of pros prosperity, prosperity and faith. Because she used to preach a prosperity gospel many years ago. She said she got it out of balance. And she went on to say this kind of thinking leads us to believe that if you got sick or your child dies, you don't have enough faith. And she thought that this kind of thinking would exempt her from trials until she got breast cancer. And when she got breast cancer, she had to reevaluate her theology. And she had to realize that here she has a mastectomy and everything she's preaching and telling people that you're going to be exempt from all of these trials in life. She realized that real faith was trusting in God for every outcome. Jesus entered a world in a womb that said, let it be done according to, uh, according to your word. And he exited the world on a cross that said, not my will, thy will be done. It's about God's will every single day, not my will, thy will. Listen, if you can't preach your theology in India or Africa, then you got to change your theology because God's word is for all people everywhere. What did Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will. That's a promise. We don't like it. It's usually not in the promise box. He said, you will have trouble. It's not trouble every day. It's not trouble all the time. Of course, there are seasons of refreshing. Sure, there are seasons where you feel God's nearness, but there are seasons where you don't feel God so near. There are seasons where your life is turned upside down, inside out. There are seasons where we feel like we are coming unglued. He says, but don't lose heart. I have overcome the world. See, you can count on trials, but you could count on the victory. Don't ever judge who's blessed and who's not blessed by outward circumstances. Because Mary had her baby in a stable and she was called blessed amongst women. So what does the word blessed really mean? Because it's morphed into good fortune or lucky. <laughs> but that's not what it means at all. To be blessed, first of all, it means chosen. You've been chosen. You didn't choose him. He chose you. You are not an accident. You're not here because your mother or your grandmother was saved. You're here because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're chosen. You've been consecrated. You've been made holy. It means that the long arm of God's grace is extended to you at all times. It's speaking to the internal state of our well-being. Right in 3 John, they wrote to this man named Gaius. He says, I pray that you would be healthy because he was battling a sickness and that your soul would prosper. See, it's a soul prospering when everything is going wrong. It's a joy unspeakable and full of glory because the world didn't give you that joy and the world can't take it away. It's the prosperity of our souls. It's unhindered fellowship with God. To be blessed means God is with you. And it's, it's a knowing as opposed to a feeling you see, I want you to leave here today. Do not believe that other stuff. It's knowing. I don't care whether I feel him or not. When I had a stroke in January and I had to be in the hospital, I knew that I knew God was with me. And I knew whatever the outcome, he was going to make a way where there seems to be no way. <laughs> to be blessed means to experience the full impact of God's presence in your life. It's knowing him as the peace speaker. When things are not so peaceful, knowing him as the way maker when there seems to be no way, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm coming out. I will fear no evil for thou art 
with me because I'm blessed. I'm blessed and highly favored. I've been chosen by God. You've been chosen by God. There's no middle class, upper class, lower class in God. We are chosen by God. Being blessed doesn't mean the absence of trouble. It means the presence of God in the midst of trouble. To be blessed and highly favored means that you have the applause of heaven. You have a great cloud of witnesses clapping for you, saying, come on, run another lap. Get up, new mercies this morning. One more lap, one more day. Keep on going. Blessed and highly favored doesn't mean a perfect life, but it means that a perfect God will stand beside you in all of life's circumstances. That's what blessing looks like when you're connected to a community of believers that are filled with the Holy Spirit and they love the Lord. And when your world is falling apart, they're going to stand beside you and they're going to pick up your arms and they're going to cause you to go forward it's not the absence of trouble. It's the presence of God and other people in the midst of the trouble. It comes through a text or a phone call or maybe your morning devotional. I have somebody in this church that sends me morning devotionals. I am telling you, she doesn't send them all the time. The one that she sends, they're so divine. It's like God is speaking right to me because I've been through a year where I have felt felt like I am coming unglued, like I am falling apart, but some way, somehow God shows up and he holds it all together. He holds it all together. <laughs> Mary, did you know that you were bringing Emmanuel, God with us? Did you know that you were bringing Emmanuel, God with us? into the world so that Emmanuel, God with us, can be in our world. To be in our world, to encourage us, to affirm us, to transform us, to renew us. They're going to just they want, just sing whatever you feel in your spirit to sing. But I want us to leave this place with our back straight and our head held high, saying God is for me. He's never gonna leave me. He's never gonna forsake me. No, my life doesn't seem perfect, but I serve a perfect God who will make a way where there seems to be no way. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to declare over yourself because the heavens are declaring over you. You are chosen, set apart, consecrated, blessed and highly favored. God is for you. He's not against you. There's no weapon. There's no enemy forged that could prosper because God has already taken the blow for us. He is going to never leave us, never, ever forsake us.